quick revision video on AS reaction rates. So we'll start with the definition. Rate of reaction can be defined as the change in concentration of a product or a reactant per unit time. So if you're looking at how the concentration of a product in moles per decimeters cubed changes over time, the graph would look like that. So it starts at zero and reaches a maximum. And if you're talking about the concentration of the reactant over time, it does the opposite. Now you can also define rate of reaction as the change in volume of gas, for example, produced, or the mass of a reaction flask per unit time. So if a chemical reaction produces a gas, then you could follow the rate of its production. So the graph would look like that. And again, if the reaction was producing a gas and you allowed it to escape from the flask, then the mass of the flask would drop. And so therefore the graph would look something like that. Sometimes you have to calculate the rate of reaction at a given point in the reaction. So I'm going to use this graph to illustrate that. So let's imagine we had to calculate the rate at that red dot there. So the first thing you do is construct a tangent to the line. And then you would work out the change in Y, so the change in concentration, and the change in X, so the change in time. Remember the definition, rate is the change in concentration per unit time. So the rate is the change in Y divided by the change in X. And the units would be moles per decimeter cubed on the top, because concentration is the Y value. And we're dividing that by time, so seconds. And then bringing that all up to the top, we've got the units moles per decimeter cube per second. And you can see that as the time ticks on, the slope of the tangent, the gradient, actually gets lower. So we've got a, a high rate of reaction here because the gradient's very steep. It's starting to slow down here. The gradient's getting less steep, even less steep here. And then when the gradient reaches zero, the reaction has stopped. So we'll look at collision theory now. So particles must collide for a reaction to occur, but they must do so with the correct orientation and they must have sufficient energy. So they've got to have the minimum amount of energy required, which is known as the activation energy. So we call these collisions successful or effective. And it's worth noting that most collisions that occur are actually not effective because they don't have enough energy so they don't have the activation energy. So reactions with a high rate would have a high frequency of effective or successful collisions or another way of saying that is there are more successful or effective collisions per second. We'll look at the factors affecting rate now so we'll run through these. Concentration so if you increase the concentration you're effectively increasing the number of particles in a set volume so that's the phrase we use for that. More particles per unit volume at the higher concentration. That means the particles are going to be closer together. So they're going to collide more frequently. And so therefore you're increasing the number of effective collisions per second. So if we look at pressure now, so we're dealing with gases, of course. So if you increase the pressure on a gas, you're going to have more particles per unit volume at the higher pressure because you're pushing them closer together. And so it's the same as concentration. The collisions are going to be more frequent, and so therefore you'll get more effective collisions per second. We'll look at temperature now. So if you increase the temperature, the particles will have more kinetic energy. So the collisions are actually going to be more energetic now, and they're also going to be more frequent. And so therefore, you're going to have more effective collisions per second. Surface area now. So if you had a lump and you ground it up into a powder, you're increasing the surface area. So because of that, you're exposing more particles for collisions to occur, and therefore there's going to be more effective collisions per second. And finally, the addition of a catalyst. Catalysts provide alternative routes for the reaction with a lower activation energy. So because of that, the collisions don't need as much energy to be effective, and so more of the collisions that are occurring have the required, the minimum amount of energy. So we're going to get more effective collisions per second.
we just look at catalysts in a bit more detail now. We're going to look at the two types of catalysts or two types of catalysis. So we've got homogeneous catalysis. That's where the catalyst and reactants are in the same physical state as each other. So the example I've got here is the depletion of ozone in the atmosphere and that's catalyzed by chlorine radicals. So everything's in the gas phase. The way it works is the catalyst reacts with the reactants to form an intermediate and then that intermediate breaks down to give the products and the catalysts reformed as a result. So if we look at the other type now, heterogeneous, so the catalysts and reactants are in different physical states. So the example I'm using is the harbour process. So we're reacting gaseous hydrogen and gaseous nitrogen and we are catalyzing the reaction with solid iron. So different physical states there. And the way the catalyst works now is it provides a surface for the reaction to take place on. So the, it's like a three-step process. The reactants are first adsorbed, not absorbed. So they are adsorbed onto the surface. So they form weak bonds with the surface. That brings them closer together. It weakens bonds in the reactants and it allows reaction to occur. And then once the products are formed, they need to leave the surface, and that's called desorption. So the products desorb from the surface. So um, heterogeneous catalysis, ARD, ARD. So if we look at catalysts and sustainability now, so catalysts, remember, allow processes to occur at lower temperatures because they've lowered the activation energy. And so because of that, less fossil fuel would be required to generate these lower temperatures. So effectively, we're preserving fossil fuel stocks. Because we're burning less fossil fuels, that means there's less carbon emissions going into the atmosphere. Scientists are now developing new catalysts, which are actually enabling the same products to be made via alternative reactions. And the great thing about these alternative reactions is they often have higher atom economies. So there's less waste involved. And that means if there's less waste, less energy and resources would be needed to process the waste. And the other thing we could bring in is these alternative reactions could involve the use of less toxic substances. And obviously that's going to have benefits um, in terms of treating substances coming off the reaction. So we'll finish with Boltzmann curves. You can see there I've got a Boltzmann curve up on the screen. Y-axis is the number of molecules and the X-axis is energy. A couple of really important points to note. The graph must start at the origin because no particles have zero energy and at the high energy part of the X-axis you must not cross the axis because basically what you would be saying there is that's the absolute maximum energy any of these particles could have and there could always be one random particle with slightly more energy than you've said. So what we'll do now is we'll look at the how the curve, the profile of the curve changes when we increase the temperature and decrease the temperature. So my teacher had a great way of explaining it. Think of it as a piece of wire. If you increase the temperature, you're raising the energy of everything. So you pull the wire to the right, to higher energy. So the shape of the curve changes to that. If you lower the temperature, then you're basically lowering the energy of everything. So you push the wire to the left and you get that profile there. So sometimes you have to explain um, rates of reaction in terms of Boltzmann curves. So if we put the activation energy on now, the Boltzmann curve shows you how many particles have at least the activation energy. And if you remember, that's the area under the curve to the right of the activation energy. So at the lower temperature, you can see the area under the curve is quite small. So there aren't many particles with at least the activation energy are higher. At the medium temperature, you've got a slightly bigger area, whereas at the high temperature, you've got a much bigger area. So at the high temperature, more particles with at least the activation energy, so you'd have more successful collisions per second. And we'll finish with the effect of a catalyst. 
um, on reaction rate. We're using a Boltzmann curve to explain. So if you remember, a catalyst lowers the activation energy, so we'll just draw another activation energy on with the catalyst, so the pink line there, and you can see the area under the curve, so the number of particles with at least this new activation energy has increased quite significantly. So there'd be more successful collisions per second.